Okay, so, and uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Chief uh, uh, Tim Cromie. So, uh, Chief Cromie is a 36 year veteran of law enforcement, uh, starting his law enforcement career in 1985. So, it's been a while. It was, uh, he joined the Nassau Bay Police Department as a Chief of Police in 2018. He previously worked for the Galveston County Sheriff's Office, Hitchcock Police Department, Santa Fe Police Department, and Dickinson uh, Police uh, Department. Uh, during his career, Chief Cromie has worked assignment as a patrol officer, uh, a patrol sergeant, uh, a dispatch communication supervisor, uh, uh, and the community policing officer, their instructor, school resource officer, detective, public information officer, and detective sergeant. Uh, he currently holds a master uh, peace officer license and a police officer instructor license from the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement and has received numerous awards and honors. Uh, I'd like to just mention some of those, uh, which is, would be uh, your, uh, your Chief Cromick has received, uh, it has been named the Rookie of the Year and Officer of the Year during uh, his career. Uh, he was awarded Detective of the Year twice in 2006 and again 2010. He was a co-recipient of the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault 2010 Champions for Social Change Award. And in 2013, TAASA recognized him with the Harold uh, Cottle uh, Justice Award for outstanding dedication and contributions in the fight to eliminate uh, sexual violence. In 2020, he received the Supervisor of the Year Award from the city of Nassau Bay. So uh, please welcome, uh, uh, it's a pleasure, uh, a pleasure uh, to, to meet you uh, in Zoom. And of course, welcome everybody who is joining us for this exciting lecture. Uh, and uh, please uh, go ahead uh, uh, you know, and uh, you can start your presentation. You. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Galveston College for inviting me for the, uh, uh, the premier, I guess the opening of the uh, lecture series for this, uh, for this year um, <clears throat> to um, let you know some things real quick. Hang on just a second. My light's going off here, so I haven't moved around enough in, in the uh, office here. But uh, mm -hmm. so my career spans quite a, a long time, and I've been um, in different departments. I'm currently with the Nassau Bay Police Department, but this goes back to my career when I was working with the uh, Dickinson Police Department. And I did um, 19 years with the, Nass with the Dickinson Police Department. So a good portion of my, my career was with Dickinson. And during that time, um, I spent 16 of those 19 years in investigations uh, working uh, child abuse crimes and uh, sex crimes. Um, and we'll, we'll get into um, how I got into this case um, after uh, the case was about 18 years old when I got involved in the case. So we'll, uh, let's see if we're moving here. Here we go. So this case originated, uh, it, the, Jennifer Shewitt is the victim in this case, and, and, and I'll talk a little bit about her in just a moment. Um, but uh, this case originated back on August 10th of 1990. Um, that was prior to my career uh, time that I was with Dickinson Police Department. I was with another agency at that time. So when this case originated, I wasn't even working with Dickinson Police Department. Um, this case is a, an attempted capital murder and sexual assault. Um, that occurred, and I say 18 years before our investigation, um, because it was another gentleman who uh, got involved with me, uh, Special Agent Richard Renison with the FBI, and uh, we teamed up on this case um, some 18 years after the orig it originated. So let's go back a little bit and give you a history of what Dickinson was like in 1990. Um, the city of Dickinson incorporated in August of 1977. Um, so the city was still somewhat, if, if you would, if in, in its infancy in 1990. Uh, the Dickinson Police Department wasn't established until 1983. And at that time, it employed one lieutenant, one sergeant, and eight officers. So it was a rather small department at the time. 
1986, the, uh, the police department created a criminal investigation uh, or investigator position. So uh, in 1990, when this uh, crime took place, they only had one investigator for the entire, uh, the entire department, the entire city at the time. And in 1990, Dickinson's population was just under 10,000, about just under 9,500. So it was still a rather small city at that time uh, in Galveston County. The victim in this case, uh, Jennifer Shewitt, Jennifer Diane Shewitt. Um, she was eight years old at the time of the abduction. Uh, she was a small child, four foot two, 45 pounds. Um, this is the address that she was living at with her mother uh, in Dickinson, Texas, uh, in an apartment complex. Her and her mother uh, were in the process of moving into a home that her grandfather had, borrow, had bought for her mother. And they were in the process at this particular time of renovating it and doing yard work and stuff. And that comes into play in a little bit. Um, when we start talking about the nighttime um, and, and what happened with Jennifer. So um, this, is, this is a fairly complex investigation and, and case and story. And usually um, when myself and, and Agent Renison and, and sometimes Jennifer, we present this case, we usually, it's about a three hour presentation. So um, we're gonna condense a lot of that, and focus on the DNA aspects of it. So, um, so I apologize if I move rather fast through or quickly through some of these um, uh, episodes, but I want, I want to get through the entire uh, information for you before we finish tonight. So the chronology of what happened, um, like I said, Jennifer and her mother had a home that they were working on during the daytime. <clears throat> and uh, on August the 9th of 1990, Jennifer went to bed with her mother around 10 or 1030, which was normal for them. Um, Jennifer uh, didn't sleep by herself. She was eight years old. She didn't sleep by herself very often. Um, that night she was wearing pink shirt with white underwear that had blue flowers on them. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, that that's a very significant part of the investigation. Um, the underwear and the clothing that Jennifer was wearing <clears throat> at about two 15 in, in the morning time, uh, Jennifer was tossing and turning. So, like I said, they were working on the house and doing some yard work and stuff. And, uh, it was a summertime and we all know in, in, you know, South Texas, Galveston County area <clears throat> in August, there's a lot of mosquitoes, a lot of, uh, bugs out in the yards and stuff like that. So Jennifer had some bug bites. She was tossing and turning. So mom asked her to go into her own bedroom. Um, so mom could get some sleep because mom had to be at work the next day. So Jennifer went, she went into the bedroom and she, uh, laid down to go to sleep. Um, and, and she wasn't used to sleeping by herself. So she was, she was counting some money out of her biggie bank and doing some other things um, in her bedroom and she finally fell asleep. Somewhere between 2.30 and seven o'clock in the morning, Jennifer was abducted through the first floor window of their apartment. Um, somebody reached in, grabbed her, pulled her out of the window, carried her down the sidewalk to a car and got in the car and, and left with her. Um, if Jennifer was here to tell you the story, Jennifer very vividly remembers um, the things that went on during that abduction and some of those things that we will talk about um, this evening. <clears throat> so in the morning, Jennifer's mother wakes up and she walks into the bedroom and she finds that Jennifer's not in the bedroom any longer and the window is open, the, the uh, curtains are blowing in the wind and things like that. Um, there was no signs of foul play other than the window being open um, and Jennifer's mother did what any other parent would do, started checking around the apartment um, looking for Jennifer, see if Jennifer was hiding or anything uh, of that nature. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't too long when Jennifer's mom realized that Jennifer was missing. Um, so she made a call to the police department. And of course, uh, police officers came out to uh, start the investigation, talk to mom. <clears throat> Jennifer didn't have any history of running away. She was only eight years old. And of course, that was one of the first uh, things that was considered a possibility. Was she, was she a runaway? Um, or did she wake up just early in the morning? Maybe she was out playing. You know, it was an apartment complex, courtyard in the middle of apartment complex. So the officer started very quickly doing a canvas of the apartments <clears throat> to, to find out from any of the neighbors if they had seen Jennifer. Did Jennifer get up? Was she playing with her friends early in the morning? Um, and very quickly, they realized that the other, the other neighbors had not seen Jennifer since the previous day, the previous afternoon or evening. Um, Jen, none of her friends were out playing already that early in the morning. So 
they started to do some more checking in the apartment complex. And you have to remember, we're going back to 1990. There were no security cameras in the apartment complex at this, at this time. Um, to have any kind of security cameras at that time in 1990 was very rare. Um, and, you know, nowadays that would be one of the first things that we would do is go to management or go to, you know, different people's apartments and start checking ring doorbells and asking management to look through the cameras, see what happened last night. But 1990, the officers didn't have that luxury of uh, having any kind of security camera. So <clears throat> by this time, the, the officers realized that they had a missing eight year old little girl and had no idea where she was. Um, and, and at this point, they didn't they didn't know if she had been abducted. Did she walk off and get lost by herself? So there was there was a full blown um, uh, investigation and, and a search going on for Jennifer. Um, looking back through the files, uh, you know, the volunteer fire department was called out. Um, so there was a there was a, a big response looking for Jennifer um, throughout the city and especially in the area around her where she lived. Later on in the afternoon, about three o'clock, the area was checked by helicopter um, overhead. And the, in the afternoon, the police department at that time um, conducted a press conference with local television stations out of Houston and stuff to announce that they had a missing child and um, asking for the public's help in locating Jennifer. While uh, after that went on, about 630 in the afternoon, Jennifer was found across town in a field. She was naked. Um, her throat was cut from pretty much almost ear to ear. Um, it had apparently been raining earlier that day um, and there were some children uh, in the field that Jennifer was playing in. There were some children that lived in the house in front of the field. And once it stopped raining, they were outside playing in the field, running around, playing chase, you know, hide and seek or whatever. And one of them actually tripped over Jennifer and that's how she was found because the grass was um, fairly tall. You would not have been able to see Jennifer laying in the field um, out there by herself because the grass was overgrown in, in this field. Um, Jennifer had probably been there for at least 12 hours, um, and, and, and she couldn't move. She couldn't, she couldn't stand up. Um, she couldn't yell for help, um, her, because her throat had been, um, cut and she just didn't have the energy or, uh, the ability to get up and, and, and go anywhere. And, and Jennifer talks about being able to look over to the side and she could see, um, a trailer house and, and, and some other things across the street. Um, and she would try to call out to people, but she just couldn't make any noise and she couldn't, she couldn't stand up. She couldn't walk. She couldn't crawl, um, because of the uh, condition that she was in. So, um, by, by luck or miracle, whatever you want to call it, you know, thank goodness one of these children ran across her, her in this field. Um, and, and immediately they contacted the police department. Uh, the family did because they had already seen the information about that she was missing. So this is Jennifer's apartment uh, in Dickinson. And if you look at the bottom left-hand corner of this picture, this is Interstate 45 Gulf Freeway. So you can see that Jennifer's apartment kind of give you an idea. Um, if you know anything about Dickinson, that's Deets Road. Um, Jennifer's apartment was just off of Deets Road. So very close to the freeway. Um, and that comes into play when we start doing some theorizing a little bit later on in the investigation. So this is where Jennifer's apartment is. And this is the route that Jennifer traveled with, or the abductor traveled with Jennifer to where she was left across town on the other side of town. Um, how do we know this? Because we were lucky enough that we had a victim who survived and was able to, uh, at some point later on, explain to everybody and talk to the officers and explain to them where um, she had traveled. Um, along Deets Road, her uh, grandfather and her grandmother actually lived across uh, on Deets Road and she actually remembers driving past their house and telling her that her abductor that my grandparents live there, you know, we, you can stop and drop me off there, um, which obviously did not happen. So this, um, <clears throat> this, this route here will come back um, to a little bit later on when we start talking about other parts of the case. So, um, so kind of remember this. Um, so it was almost not quite three and a half miles from her home. The interesting thing is, as we as investigators get involved in the case later on, one of the interesting things is, why was Jennifer abducted from her bedroom uh, apartment down there in the bottom left-hand corner, which is just a couple of blocks away from I-45, and, and the abductor didn't go to I-45, which they could have traveled down to Dickinson, uh, Galveston, or they could have headed north through Houston up towards Dallas, um, but, but they chose to drive, drive into the middle of Dickinson. So that, that again, 
that's how we think sometimes in, in, in the world of police work and investigation is why did this not happen and why did this happen? And, and, and we'll talk about that a again a little bit later on here. So let's recap the initial investigation. We know that Jennifer was located about at least 12 hours later, about almost three and a half miles from her, away from her apartment um, in the middle of Dickinson. She was completely naked, had no clothes on. She was laying in an ant bed. Um, her throat was cut from ear to ear. She was unable to speak. Um, and she was flown by helicopter ambulance uh, to uh, Life Flight to UTMB in Galveston. Um, I guess what, and, and as I discuss the case tonight, I'll talk about, um, there were a lot of um, Easter eggs, golden eggs, things, luck that came out through the investigation early on. And then again, later on when myself, uh, when I got involved some 18 years later, and, we'll, and I'll point out some of those. But one of the things is, you know, this could have happened anywhere. Um, and I, I, I think not luckily that Jennifer was abducted, but um, so close to having uh, a level one trauma center that that she could go to for the care that she got. Um, because I, I, I think that played a big part in, in her recovery and, and just her surviving. Um, these are some of the hospital photos of Jennifer. Um, obviously, she's, she's intubated being able to help her breathe and stuff like that. So, um, and these are probably some of the photos that are not as severe as some of the other ones. Um, when I first got the case, I know one of the things I saw when I started looking through these photos was, um, I, the first thing I thought to myself was, oh my God, these are some of the mo most horrific autopsy photos that I have seen in my career. Um, forgetting that I had, before I got the case assigned to me, I had actually met uh, Jennifer Shewitt uh, in the office at the police department. Um, so it took me a minute to realize that these were not autopsy photos. These were photos of a victim who had survived. Um, and it's miraculous that she survived um, the attack that she did. So Jennifer was flown out, um, taken to the hospital. It was late in the evening. And um, the next day, uh, officers went out, started canvassing the area again to do a more thorough search of where she was located and expanded their search. Um, Clothing belonging to Jennifer was located the next day in the area of where uh, very close, almost a quarter of a mile um, to where Jennifer was located. Um, there was a pair of white girls panties with blue roses, a pink pajama top. And like I said, that's very important. There was also a pair of men's underwear and a man's t-shirt um, that were together with these. Um, on that third bullet point, you'll see there's a quotation there. And I took this directly from uh, officer Sacedo's report. Uh, officer Sacedo was the officer with Dickinson who found the uh, clothing and he reported the clothes appeared that the male's underwear had been torn off or cut off and they were wrapped with the child's pink shirt. And to me that's a very important statement in because he puts all of that together. It's not just that maybe all of this happened to be in the same area but he actually um, determines and writes that the clothing, the, the underwear belonging to a, a man and a t-shirt were actually wrapped together with uh, what was believed to be Jennifer's clothing. So that's a very important uh, part to put all of the evidence together. All of these items were eventually turned over to the Galveston County Sheriff's Office. So where Jennifer was abducted from was inside the city limits of Dickinson. Where she was found and located was still in Dickinson, what's considered Dickinson, but it was outside the city limits of Dickinson, uh, the incorporated city limits of Dickinson. So the area where Jennifer was found fell to the jurisdiction of the Galveston County Sheriff's Department. So immediately, two different law enforcement agencies are involved in Jennifer's um, abduction um, and, and recovery because we have two different locations of uh, crime scenes and, and evidence and things like that. So the Sheriff's Department was involved in this case um, very early on within the first day. This is a 22nd Street just off of California where Jennifer was located in a field. Um, and right around the corner, you can see there is marked where Jennifer, the area where Jennifer's clothing was located. Now I will tell you, if you look on the right-hand side of that screen, all of that area was overgrown. This is a, a much uh, newer uh, aerial image uh, from Google. And all that development, those houses and stuff, that, that's a current day um, thing. But back in uh, 1990, all of that area was just overgrown fields. So um, these are some actual evidence photos of the clothing and everything that was uh, found in, in, as Officer Sacedo mentioned, 
The clothing was wrapped together with the pink night shirt. So here's a closer picture. And you can see the men's underwear and the pink night shirt that was belong that uh, alleged to belong to Jennifer. Um, and this area here will get even closer. You can see that the underwear was torn or ripped for some reason. Um, it, it wasn't taken off. It wasn't in one piece. Um, and then there were a lot of theories when we looked at this case. Uh, you know, did somebody um, have control of Jennifer and decide to rip off the underwear? Um, were they driving away? They decided to get rid of all the clothing, um, including Jennifer's of, in their own. Um, they, they, there's, there's a whole uh, gamut of things, but it's interesting about the tear on this underwear. And I'll talk about that again uh, later on when we talk about the DNA. So while Jennifer was in the hospital, she was in the hospital for about 10 days uh, or 10, 10 days or two weeks um, recovering before she was released. These are some handwritten notes from Jennifer that uh, she had written to her mom. Uh, he said his name was Dennis. Um, he said, uh, I said, do you know my dad's name? He said, no. Uh, over here, the, she talked about some colors on the car. The man told me to take your clothes off. I said, no, he took them off. Uh, there was a couple of houses I would try to go um, to call 911, but every time I would try to stand up, I would just fall. Um, he said he was an undercover cop. He had a big gun. Um, he said he didn't have his badge or his gun right now. Um, and that's one of the things when I got involved with the case. And, you know, I don't know that you need any other kind of motivation to investigate something like this. But as a police officer, um, a career police officer, to have something like this, a, a, an eight-year-old child um, who was told that, you know, by somebody who took advantage of them that, he was an undercover cop. That tells me one of two things. We have a police officer um, who is gone off, off the rails and, and, and is using his position to abduct children, or we have somebody who's lying to this child. And, and certainly the hope is that it's the second and not the first um, of those options. Um, she also wrote down that he choked me four times as hard as he could while in the car. Uh, the man undressed me and uh, he licked my toe uh, and right before that, he drank some beer. Uh, the man dragged me to a big field at the very bottom of the other uh, uh, note there. She writes, I'm in, I'm in pain. Um, and, and that just kind of gets to you when you realize she's, she's still in pain in the hospital. Um, he drove to the woods. Uh, I got out and, and got out and I did too. He undressed me. She talked about him licking her again. Um, so she describes everything that was going on. Um, she, like I said, she vividly remembers the entire event, um, almost all of it. There are times where she blacked out, she didn't. Um, and, and they went to the back seat. She talks about him having a pocket knife and then dragging her to a field. Uh, he told her he was your uncle, um, told her some things about her mom and her dad, um, different things. They went by her school, uh, told her he was gonna take her by her school. Um, here's the important part, I think, in, in a lot, all of this is very important because this is a firsthand account in Jennifer's handwriting of what happened. But she talks right here about the pink shirt and the underwear that was white had blue roses. She describes the clothing that she was wearing that night in her own handwriting, and that's what was found the next day, less than a quarter of a mile away from where she was found. So it's very important documentation that puts all this evidence together again. So. Um, she talks about being asleep and the man opened the window and he grabbed her um, and, and, you know, grabbed her and shut up on the other side. So all good information to have that uh, she was writing these notes to her mom and that the, the police department um, back in 1990 collected this as evidence and it was in the case files. So about four days after Jennifer was abducted on, on the 14th of August, um, a young lady at that time by the name of Lois Gibson, and, and if you're familiar with Many of you may be familiar with Lois Gibson's work. Uh, Lois Gibson was a uh, up and coming um, forensic artist working for the Houston Police Department. Uh, just recently in the last year or so, Lois has retired. Um, but Lois is, was, is very good at what she, she does and did um, as a sketch artist. This was one, early on one of her, in her career. Um, notably, Lois has, in, in the last five years or so, I think it was, she was named 
to the Guinness Book of World Records because as a sketch uh, forensic artist for the police department, she had more captures with her sketches um, than any other uh, sketch artist or forensic artist in the field of uh, police work. So, um, but this was one of her earlier, and this is what um, Jennifer was in the hospital. She was unable to speak still on the 14th. Um, she was on medication for her injuries and Lois came down and was able, the doctors gave them an hour to work together. And Lois basically showed her books and books of noses and eyes and ears and things like that. And Jennifer would point and she would shake her head yes. And, and this is a composite sketch that was given um, or that was developed by Lois and uh, Jennifer working together. Um, I don't know how much weight you would put into a sketch like this because it's an eight-year-old girl. Um, she's been through a traumatic event just four days earlier. She's still on medication. Um, but this was one of this was this was a valuable piece of information that they had or evidence back in 1990. Um, the, the sketch. Jennifer also insisted that she wanted Lois to draw the, the card. She described it to Lois as best as she could. This was not something that Lois did on a regular basis, but because Jennifer was so adamant about it, Lois went ahead and sketched a car also. Um, from Jennifer's description. And we'll come back to both of these in a little bit. So the evidence, um, back in 1990, Jennifer's panties were sent off and they were tested for serology, but there was no DNA test completed at that time. DNA was in its infancy at that time. And the standard at the time was to test uh, evidence for serology, um, but they were not able to check for DNA. At that time, you needed a huge amount of uh, biological evidence um, to get any kind of DNA. Um, it, it's much different nowadays. Um, you know, that they can get a profile from DNA samples that, that we can't even see with the naked eye. Um, Jennifer's pajama top back in 1990 was not even sent off for any testing. Um, and the men's underwear that was found next to Jennifer's underwear, again, it was only tested for serology, for blood typing and things like that. There was no DNA testing done on any of this evidence. Um, back in 1990, because that was just not the norm, and that was just not something that happened. Um, so let's jump ahead, and, 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 I, and I'm jumping ahead to 2008 for condensing purposes. There were there were other detectives that had this case from 1990 through 2008. I don't want anyone to think that this case was taken and wrapped up and put on a shelf or anything. There were, I think, there were uh, before I got the case, there were probably at least two, I think, three uh, detectives that had the case. Um, so the case was never put away. But in January of 2008, the case is assigned to me. Um, my supervisor in criminal investigations division at Dickinson had the case. Um, the, the captains were being moved around from division to division. And my captain called me in and said, I'm going to give you this case. This and he gave me a, a synopsis of the case. Um, and he said, you know, I'm, I'm handing you the case because my assignments at that time were child abuse cases and sexual assault cases. So here, this is your case. Thanks boss, I appreciate that. Um, here's an 18 year old case. So um, I started reading um, through the, the case files and started looking at things and, and, and I got somewhat excited because it was a cold case. It, it did not have a, a resolution to it. And as, as police officers and detectives, that's what we do. We, we, we want to solve cases. Um, one of the other interesting things that got me excited about it was that we had a live victim. Jennifer was alive. Um, so there was a victim I could sit down with and talk to about this. Uh, horrendous crime. So on February the 18th, um, I had set up a meeting and Jennifer came down to the police department. Um, she knew my uh, supervisor because they had talked previously on following up on the investigation. So we sat down together in a conference room and I was pretty excited about meeting with Jennifer. Um, I can tell you at this time that that meeting did not go the way I wanted it to. Um, Jennifer was uh, fairly upset and she was not excited about meeting another investigator, another detective. She had kind of built relationships with the other ones uh, that had had her case for years. Um, so it kind of threw me off uh, a little bit because I, it was not what I was expecting. Um, but I did tell her, I said, I will do whatever I can. I will work for as long as I can until I retire to get you the answers that you need. Um, I left that meeting on that note and, and I went back, sat at my desk and thought, oh my God, what did I just tell her? I, ha I had not even finished looking at the entire case report 
Um, but here I was telling her because she was so upset, she was crying, I'll do whatever I can. So, um, and this is where Agent Renison, Richard Renison with the FBI comes into play. Richard um, and I knew each other because Richard had worked for the Lee City Police Department um, before he went off to the FBI. Um, and we both worked on Galveston County has a child abuse team that works uh, through the Children's Advocacy Center. Um, any of the child, any of the child cases, uh, sexual assault cases, child abuse, physical abuse cases that detectives are assigned to, they have meetings every Wednesday to discuss the cases throughout the county. And uh, Richard and I had been on that team, so we knew each other um, from working child abuse cases before he went off to the FBI. So we talked with each other on a semi-regular basis. And in early 2008, we were talking one time, and, and, and the discussion came up. He said. I understand you have a case. And I said, yes. And I kind of gave him a synopsis. And it, it, the, just from being um, friends and, and working the cases together, it was almost like, well, you know, if there's anything I can do for you, sure, you know, we'll work together. Um, he and I had a great working relationship. So that's kind of how we, we came together to work on this case as a team um, from Dickinson Police Department and the FBI, because luckily we had that connection already. So um, the first thing we did was to go through the case file, which was several boxes of stuff, um, different things that had been taken in inventory that we had at the Dickinson Police Department. I asked our inventory, our uh, evidence uh, detective, I said, can you bring me everything on this case? And he brought these two big boxes that were just files of paperwork and, and, and uh, cassette tapes and videotapes and, and, and just all kinds of stuff. Um, and so we were going through all of that. One of the things that we learned because of Galveston County Sheriff's Department being involved and where Jennifer was located, that all, almost all of the physical evidence was in the custody of the Galveston County Sheriff's Department, if they still had that evidence. From 1990 to 2008, Galveston, uh, Galveston Island had been through two major hurricanes. There had been flooding on the island. The Galveston County Sheriff's Department had moved from their original, uh, from, from their one office into the new offices that they're at down on the, uh, you know, closer to 61st street. So we were, we were a little concerned that some of the evidence may not be around after 18 years. So one of the things that we decided to do was to make a list of different people to interview and possible suspects and go back and talk. After 18 years, people like to talk sometimes, you know, they may know things about a case and originally when it happens, they don't want to talk because of fear, retaliation or whatever, but sometimes after 18 years, time is, is an advantage. So we started making a list of those type of things, but the number one priority that we had was we need to look at this evidence. So what did we do? We called up the Sheriff's Department and we talked to John Pruitt, who was a Lieutenant at this time. Um, and what we found out was 18 years earlier, John Pruitt was a deputy assigned to the ID division of the sheriff's department and, uh, excuse me for just, and John was assigned the night that Jennifer was found to go out and collect evidence at the scene. So all of a sudden now we have the Lieutenant who's a, a, over the uh, identification division for the sheriff's department in 2008. And he has a personal connection to this case, even before I was involved or before agent Renison, Rich Renison was involved. So we went down and met with him and every piece of evidence would have been collected, handled, packaged just perfectly. Um, we picked four items out of the 65 items of evidence to send off to the FBI lab for retesting. And that was Jennifer's nightshirt, underwear, the men's underwear, and the, um, the, the t-shirt, the men's t-shirt. Uh, we also sent a sample of Jennifer's DNA for comparison purposes. So while we're waiting for this DNA to come back, and it took almost a year and a half, um, we started re-interviewing numerous people. Um, there were various media outlets that started doing stories about Jennifer's case. Um, America's Most Wanted featured um, Jennifer's story. Um, Channel 2 did a whole hour on her story. And as we were doing what we would call old school investigation, you know, talking to people and following up on things, um, there was a name uh, by the name of Kenny Gonzalez that can, kept coming up. Um, and we actually found that in, in one of the reports that we saw. So we started doing some research on Kenny Gonzalez and found out that he was in Texas prisons for sexual assault of a child. Um, his picture kind of resembled the composite sketch. Um, we found out that at the time of Jennifer's abduction, he lived in the area and he also knew Jennifer's mother. So, uh, you know, we call those clues in police work. So uh, Richard Renison and I start to make plans to go to prison because 
he was in prison at the, at the time we were investigating this case. So we're starting to make plans to try to go to prison and interview Kenny Gonzalez. So September 22nd of 2009, I remember getting a call in the middle of the night. It was from uh, Richard Renison on my cell phone. And I wake up in the middle of the night, and I, you know, I, I'm half asleep and I answer the phone and he said, we got a DNA hit. So uh, the FBI lab um, in Quantico was working overtime and they were working 24 hours around the clock um, at that time because of uh, some other things going on. Um, and he says, we have a hit, a DNA hit. And my first thought in, in the middle of my sleep was, well, this is going to be great information when we go and talk to Kenny Gonzalez. Dennis Earl Bradford was the profile um, that came up on the DNA hit. And I asked uh, Richard, I said, who is Dennis Earl Bradford? He said, well, I don't know. I've never heard that name before. Remember, it's the middle of the night. Um, you remember this handwritten note? He said his name was Dennis. Jennifer identified him for everybody some 19 years earlier, but we just didn't have the information to connect that. We found out real quickly during that night that uh, Dennis Bradford was convicted in 1997 for a sexual assault that occurred in 1996 of an adult female in Hot Springs, Arkansas. He received a 12-year prison sentence and served four of those years and then was released on parole. Um, he was arrested in March of 1991 for an assault on a female in a post office in the middle of the night in Hot Springs, Arkansas. So um, we quickly found out that Dennis Earl Bradford was in um, Arkansas. So how do we establish somebody who lives in Arkansas some 18, 19 years now earlier traveling through Dickinson or how do we connect them? So we started doing again, some of that old school um, police work. We started going through record files and things like that. We were able to show that um, he was arrested in Dickinson, Texas on September 23rd of 1987 um, almost three years before Jennifer was abducted uh, in Dickinson on a traffic offense. He listed 500 Tanglewood as his address at that time. Um, he also listed his father as next of kin and had a, a Ohio Street address listed on his as his father's next of kin. We did some checking with the school and got some school records and the Ohio Street address was again listed. Um, we did some checking with DPS. His driver's license um, had the 30. 3520 Ohio Street. So all of this is coming together that we can now say that we, we feel like Dennis Earl Bradford has a connection to Dickinson. So again, going back to um, looking at some of the maps, this is Jennifer's apartment uh, over on Lobit Drive. And this is the 500 Tanglewood apartment complex where um, Dennis Bradford lived, um, kind of looked right across the field from each other. Um, and you remember this, we talked about this path that they took when Jennifer um, was abducted, this is the Ohio Street address. It's just a little over a quarter of a mile off of the route that she was driven by her abductor. So very close to, kind of goes back to why did they not, why did this person who abducted her not drive down I-45? Because they were staying in some place that they were familiar with, where they lived in Dickinson. Um, again, these are clues that, that go into adding on to the fact that we have a DNA profile. So uh, real quickly, we found out Dennis Earl Bradford, driver's license from DPS in Texas, uh, expired in 1994. We asked for a copy of that, and we got a copy of it. Um, and so we had picture from the driver's license around 1990 or there, you know, from Dennis' picture. So this is the composite sketch that they did, and this is the picture from his DL. We felt like that was a pretty close match. Um, and I say that a little sarcastically because when we both uh, got this picture, um, it, it was just, yeah, it, it was mind boggling how close that sketch is to his picture. Um, it, it's just amazing that an eight year old girl in the condition she, she was in could go um, and, and, and give a composite sketch like that. So some things that we found about Dennis Earl Bradford, he lived in Little, North Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, shortly before we got, the, we got this DNA hit in August of 2009, he was arrested again for solicitation of a prostitute in North Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, so we went to our, our DA at the time in Galveston County with Kirk Sistrunk, and we met with them at their office, and uh, we, we were able to get an arrest warrant, had one of the judges sign an arrest warrant for uh, Dennis Earl Bradford, um, and we made plans and contacted authorities over in Arkansas. And on October the 12th, uh, 2009, uh, Richard Grenison and I traveled to Arkansas 
And on October the 13th, with the assistance of the North Little Rock Police Department, um, Dennis Earl Bradford was arrested and brought over to their uh, investigative unit where um, Agent Renison and I sat down with Dennis Bradford for about um, four hours and interviewed him. We did, we, uh, we wanted to get a confession um, for prosecutorial reasons for trial. We didn't, we did not tell Dennis Earl Bradford we had any DNA. Um, we didn't want a defense attorney in court to say, well, you told him you had DNA and that forced him, you know, to, to, to confess to something he didn't do because you had DNA. Um, we did not have any DNA on Jennifer's panties or pajamas. So outside of all the information that we had from Jennifer about that being her clothing, we didn't have any DNA connecting it to her. So those were some of the reasons that we didn't come forward with the DNA when we sat down with him the first time. But he did confess. Um, he identified the, the vehicle that he was driving as a blue Chevrolet Malibu owned by his mother. Um, he said at one point, Jennifer was so scared that she actually soiled her pants in the front seat of the car. And, and, and I'll tell you, that's not the language that he used when he told us. Um, he first uh, attempted to break her neck, but he was un physically unable to do so. He didn't know why. Um, you remember the handwritten note she wrote? He choked me four times as hard as he could. So uh, he admits to using the knife and cutting her throat so that she won't be able to tell anyone and she won't be able to feel anything. Um, he wanted her dead so he could have his way with her. Although those are his words. Um, it, was, it was pretty much a matter of fact. Uh, um, not, not a great deal of emotion all the time when he was talking to us. Uh, he leaves her in the field for dead and takes the car and drives it to a car wash to clean it up. Um, when the sketch is released to the media, he shaves off his mustache immediately and, and doesn't grow it back again. Um, he did tell us it was completely random. He'd never seen her before. Um, didn't really know why. He was driving through that apartment complex parking lot and he saw something inside that window that was pink or something and made him think that maybe there was a female in there. And that's why he went and looked in that window. Um, so this was truly one of those um, odd, out of the blue, um, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a, a friend or a relative or something like that. So on um, October the 14th, uh, the day after he was arrested, we interviewed him. Um, the, uh, Agent Renison and I went to court in Pulaski County District Court in Arkansas for an extradition hearing. Um, extradition hearing is simply to determine that the person who is arrested is the person that is named in the warrant. It's, there's, there's no information in the extradition hearing about his guilt or his innocence, just is this the correct person? Um, and at that point, Dennis Earl Bradford waived his extradition um, to come back to Texas with uh, Agent Renison and I. So later that day, we were able to fly back to uh, Houston um, with Dennis Earl Bradford and bring him and then drive him back to Dickinson, Texas. This is a, a it was a media circus the night we got back. Um, this is one of the, the, the news media um, photos of uh, that's Agent Renison on the other side, Dennis Earl Bradford and, and, and me carrying him, walking him into the police department in Dickinson. Um, so this is his uh, picture that we took the day we were interviewing him. That's what he looked some uh, 19 years later. Shortly after we got back about a week later, get a call from a female who says, hey, I, I used to date Dennis Bradford uh, about the time I saw this on the news and everything. And I have some pictures. She was talking to me. She said, I had two pictures, one with him sitting with me with, a, you know, he had a mustache at the time and one in his mother's car because we never have to this day been able to find that car. It's probably been scrapped and, and, and you know, um, but anyhow, she said, I have a picture of him in the car. She asked me a question on the phone. Would you be interested in those pictures? Um, I, anybody out there probably can figure out what my answer was. It was, yes, I would like to see those pictures. So she brought them to us. This is a picture of uh, her and Dennis together. And so those are the three pictures we were able to put together at the time of our investigation of Dennis. And, and I, I refer to that as the three faces of evil. Um, this is the picture of him sitting in the car. Again, a, a, amazing, just the resemblance of the sketch to what was actually, you know, in fa a fact in the car. Um, again, all this is evidence that we're putting together on top of the DNA to, to show things that, you know, um, put everything together. We never got to trial on May 10th of 2010 while Dennis Earl Bradford was in the Galveston County Jail awaiting trial. He uh, took the opportunity and he hung himself and killed himself in the jail. So we never got to go to trial on Dennis Earl Bradford. 
Um, and, and there's a general consensus in the general public that, well, that's a great thing because it um, saved the taxpayers money. But I can tell you that the victim in this case, uh, Jennifer Shewitt, who had been waiting, you know, some 19, 20 years by this time to have her day in court and sit across the room from the monster who attacked her. Um, again, that was ripped out from underneath her. So uh, it was very devastating to Jennifer um, for a long period of time uh, that, that she didn't have the opportunity to, to um, sit across the room and, and read a uh, victim impact statement to her, to uh, Dennis Earl Bradford. I will tell you that she did find out where Dennis Earl Bradford was um, buried. Um, and on the 20th anniversary of her abduction, uh, she and her boyfriend at the time, uh, her husband now, they traveled and she sat on his grave and she read her victim impact statement to him uh, there. So uh, she's an amazing woman. I wish we had more time where you could meet her. Um, but, but those are the kind of things that she does to take care of herself. So what worked well for us, uh, the relationship that um, Richard Renison and I had together. Um, there were still almost all the investigators involved in the previous cases were around if we needed to talk to them. We worked with the FBI's behavioral analysis unit um, team, um, but we had a live victim to work with, somebody who could sit down and tell us what happened and answer questions for us. And then of course we had the DNA evidence, um, which was just amazing. Um, we were told by the, by the DNA uh, analysis, to, the, the chemist up at the Quantico, that the reason that they were able to get a profile off of the underwear is because when it was ripped or cut, that elastic band stretched across his skin. And, and that's where um, the DNA was, was skin cells. Um, so who knows if it, had not, if it had not been ripped off of him, would we have the DNA that was on the, um, on the underwear? Um, because that's where it came from, the, uh, the waistband. This is a picture of the night we got back uh, on the uh, left-hand side in the red, that's uh, Agent Renison. And in the middle is Jennifer and that's me on the right-hand side. This is uh, after we got back and we're able to put him uh, in Dickinson jail, uh, we went out for dinner. Um, the, the three of us along with uh, Jennifer's um, boyfriend at the time, her husband now, Jonathan. So while we were gone in um, Arkansas, working on this case, once we made the arrest, there was a um, uh, press conference at the Dickinson Police Department. And I, we, Richard and I were not there, but I did get to see, uh, we got to see video clips from it. And one of the things I took away was a statement that Jennifer made. Uh, I think it was probably the best statement of the whole uh, uh, press conference was, I am not a victim, but instead victorious. And, and that's been her entire attitude since she was, you know, an eight-year-old little girl. She's been, she's been victorious and she has overcome a lot of uh, emotional things and stuff. And, and that's her boyfriend there on the right. That's Jonathan. Um, and the happy ending to this is, this is Jennifer and Jonathan and Jenna and Jonah. That's their family now. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's a very um, bitter, bittersweet story, but in the long run, uh, there, there's a wonderful family out of all this. And, and we were um, very happy that we were able to give Jennifer some closure and some answers. Um, and, you know, the DNA in this case was, was just amazing what had changed in 19, 18 and 19 years in order to be able to get a DNA profile that wasn't available to her when she was an eight-year-old little girl. So this is my contact information and I'll leave it up here. And uh, I think we have some time. If there's any questions, I'll be more than happy to take some questions from anybody. Um, okay, please, uh, please uh, go ahead. Uh, please go ahead and ask questions. Uh, we are open for questions right now. You can unmute yourselves and ask the question. Okay. Okay. Any any questions? Uh, you can also post on a chat if you like. Mr. Cromie, this yes. is Elvis. This is Elvis Segura. Um, I have two granddaughters, and this was very. I, it's heartbreaking to hear um, as a grandmother. Um, wow, I couldn't even imagine um, the mother and um, all their relatives for Ms. Shewitt. Um, What tips would you say that is um, that we could take to just, I know that there's a lot of stuff like even from the schools that they help out with uh, a picture for our kids and our grandkids to carry and to share with their family members. And I hate to I hate to carry it around, but I have it in my in my wallet. I have my my seven year old granddaughter's picture. It's almost like a little ID. This is who she is. This is what she looks like, and so forth. And I mm -hmm. 
I'm very grateful for stuff like that. But um, are there any tips that you would give? Um, I mean, I feel like now bubble wrapping her, honestly. Um, I, I just am speechless. Are, are, are there any kind of tests you're, you're asking about? No, just in general. Um, I know that that's, I mean, I think my kids at one time used to have like little fingerprints done, like their thumb print and uh, so, index finger. Yeah, I would, I would suggest that everybody, um, you know, uh, do some research on the internet, talk to your children about safety, talk to them about good touch and bad touch and talk to them about their bodies that, and their bodies are their own and that, um, uh, that, and also talk to them about if, if it's somebody they don't know that they need to let other people in the area know that this person is not, it's not my uncle, it's not my dad, it's not my grandmother. You know, um, if, if somebody is, is trying to pick them up and take them, they need to make as much noise as possible. Okay. Um, I'm going to tell you something that, that is probably not going to make a whole lot of people, but the fingerprints and stuff are wonderful. But remember that having a copy of your, your child or your grandchild's fingerprints is not going to keep them from being abducted or, or being lost or them getting lost or, or run away or anything like that. Those fingerprints are going to be for one thing, and that's to be able to identify that child later on. OK, um, so it's, I'm not saying don't have those fingerprints, but you need to talk to your children and your grandchildren and, and, and have those those tough conversations with them about what to do, um, you know, who to be with and who not to be with. Um, don't go off with strangers, those type of things. Uh, th those are tough conversations for parents because parents don't want to don't want to face the reality that sometimes these things happen. And I will tell you in the big scheme of things, and when we, we see these stories a lot on the news and on 2020 and, and you know, the different thing, but it, it truly is rare for children to be abducted by a stranger. Um, it's very rare. So when these things do happen, the media, they, they, they run with these stories, okay? So it, it, it's very difficult for us to have these conversations with our, with our children. So we need to have those conversations with our children about uh, what, what they can do and, and make them understand as children. I'm not talking about talking to them about being rude to grownups and everything, but they, they need to understand that children, if there's an adult that's trying to do them harm as a child, they have the right to let everybody know and they have the right to fight that, you know, to, to protect themselves and fight themselves away from somebody like that. So um, that's the best I can tell you is have those, have those tough conversations with your children. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Are there yeah. any? I, I'd like to ask one question. You mentioned that at that time there were no video cameras or anything, and now we have a lot of cameras, right? So we do. Uh, and and so how this has changed investigation? I mean, so uh, the, you know, having having the video video surveillance that's that's so popular around, uh, you know, that people have door, you know, ring doorbells and they have, they have video cameras and they have surveillance cameras on their homes that, you know, look at their driveways and look at the streets. Um, a lot of uh, these type of uh, uh, apartment complexes and stuff now, businesses, you know, inside the stores, they have a lot of uh, uh, video surveillance cameras. So um, in, in an, in an event like this, if we had something like this happen today, one of the things that we would do, we would have an officer or two assigned to start going around the immediate areas and start looking for video um, cameras and checking with businesses and checking and knocking on doors of neighbors. Do you have any video cameras? Can, can we look at, you know, your video cameras? Can you look at it and see if you can find it? You'll see it all the time. Uh, the different police departments will put information out on their social media pages that they're looking for information. If anybody in this area has video cameras, please check during this time. And if you have something, contact us. Um, so these type of investigations nowadays are very much a combination of the police department and the public because the public has information, um, has access to those things that uh, might be helpful to us. And, and surveillance is, is cameras, again, not by itself will that um, necessarily solve anything. Uh, we still have to identify who those people are, but it certainly can give us a lead if there's a vehicle involved or a description of somebody in certain clothing description or even a direction of travel that they're moving. So. Um, the surveillance cameras are, are, are important, um, an, an important piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there a couple of chats, questions? Or? Okay. I, I actually, this is John Ridland. I have one if it's okay. Sure. 
Yes, sir. Um, it's amazing what the uh, the uh, changes that are that are happening with the DNA uh, investigations and such. And oh, and by the way, I think that a couple of mentions on the chat. Thanks for persevering. If something like that happened to my daughter, I would have, uh, you know, pray that somebody like you would pop in and uh, help uh, the situation. But uh, you, it's amazing over that time, the uh, advances in DNA. And I recall here, I mean, not that recently, but now uh, the Golden State Killer, where now they're using DNA, not mm -hmm. only as uh, direct evidence, but as, in, as a way to kind of gather information and, and, and use uh, some of the DNA sure. testing in general. Yes. Is that something that's becoming more common? Is that something that uh, is more Oh, absolutely. Uh, so I, I will give you a real quickly a story. Because of uh, this case, uh, we've been invited all over the country and, and up into Canada to do uh, presentations on this. And one of the uh, several years after uh, this case was was solved and then closed. Uh, we were invited to the um, uh, International Symposium on Human Identification, which is all about um, LabCorp and the, uh, the different uh, DNA processing from all over the world. Huge conference, and um, I didn't really understand a lot of it because it was scientific and technical. It was way over my head, but I got to stay. But some of the things that they were talking about at that conference, um, and this was almost 10 years ago, about taking a DNA, you know, from uh, in developing a profile in an actual um, composite of somebody's facial features and eye colors and, and skin and hair color and things, you know, they were talking about being able to do these in the future are now happening. Um, if you, I don't know if anybody's paid attention to um, what's referred to as the killing fields uh, down in League City area. Um, and you just had a couple of their detectives in the last, uh, oh, about three years, they had two victims that were unidentified, two female victims that had been found off Calder Road years and years and years ago. And because of the DNA um, advances and being able to work through familial DNA and go backwards, they were able to identify two of their victims um, in, in you know, cases that were extremely cold uh, for League City, So, which has moved those investigations into a whole different um, uh, realm of now possibly being able to uh, look at you know, people that were connected to them some years ago. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not happening just in the big cities, you know, in, in Houston and, you know, out in the Golden Gate area, it's, it's happening here locally, uh, you know, in the Houston Galveston area. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's just, it's DNA and, and it's, and it's amazing what can, the information we can get from that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hello, one, one more one more question, Jerry Pierce. Um, knowing of the DNA advancements, have the communication networks between, let's say, FBI, uh, local uh, sheriff, uh, city, county, what have you, has that been aligned so they can uh, access information quicker? Have, have, have more improvements been made with that? Yeah, there, 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 there's a CODIS system that's out there that um, has that information. And, and so not only does uh, the FBI's lab out in Quantico and their labs have the access to CODIS through when they develop DNA, but the, the state labs, te Texas Department of Public Safety. But not only is it, is it the CODIS um, uh, network that we have that's um, maintained by FBI, but now you have 23andMe and all, all of these private um, uh, DNA corporations that are, that are, you know, people are trying to do their family trees and stuff. And so uh, right now there's a lot of, there's some legal aspects that are going on about how much of that can be used to go back and, and find relatives and start to work on some of these other cases. And, and so there's a challenge there with the legal aspects of, you know, somebody sends in their DNA, you know, I spit in a tube and I send it to 23andMe so that I can get my DNA profile. You know, how much can that be used now in, the, the uh, criminal aspect of an investigation. Um, so there's a lot of that going on, but yes, there's there's a lot of communication between the different entities and local law enforcement and the FBI about all the DNA processing and stuff going back and forth. So. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you for the question. So. All right. Any, any, any more questions? Yeah, I'd just like to say something to Chief for report. Yes. Hey Chief, my name is Jordan Reyes. I work for the city of Cool Lake Shores Police Department. I've been a police officer for the past 10 years. My wife is actually a Houston Police Department uh, 
child sex crimes investigator. I just want to applaud you for your years of service and what you've done, your resilience towards that case. I'm very well aware of the Dickinson and uh, Clear Lake area. Actually, I was in a pursuit last year, a couple of nights with uh, your guys from Nassau right. Bay. But uh, I just want to applaud you. I, I didn't. I wasn't aware of the case, and obviously, it takes a certain type of individual to uh, continuously serve and serve others uh, to uh, to give her some type of closure. And that that is a big deal. That's what we do this for. And I just want to thank you for your service, sir. Well, I appreciate it. And in in one of the, one of the people that was um, influential in my career is your chief, uh, uh, Tracy Keel. Um, we worked together over at Dickinson. I know he's your chief over there, and he's one of those people. Also that, you know, he, he's a, a lifetime law enforcement gentleman. So you've got a great chief leading you over there, but I appreciate that. Um, and, and, uh, and, and Chief Keel TK was very much involved in, in helping us, uh, you know, with some of the aspects of this case. He was very much involved uh, back at some point in time. So awesome thank you. Here. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, uh, any more questions? Okay. So I, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for your service. I mean, it's, it's amazing how much effort goes and, and you know, how much dedication it takes to, to really solve these cases. I mean, that's, uh, uh, well, it's, it's unbelievable. Well, thank, thank you very much for having me. And, and, and uh, thanks to everybody for the, the comments on, on chat and stuff. And the, the biggest thing is to remember is, you know, that we, we, do this, we do what we do is for people like Jennifer the victims and the survivors to get them answers. Um, sometimes we're, we're not as, you know, lucky as we are with uh, the cases, but, but we, I, I, most of the people I know in law enforcement, you know, 99% of them, they, they give the same effort. Um, and it's all that we're here, you know, to take care of the public and, and to provide for our communities. And we try to get answers for those victims and survivors. So, but thank you to everyone for tuning in tonight and, and being part of the uh, presentation. And I appreciate the invitation from uh, uh, Crystal Robinson over at the Law Enforcement Division in Galveston College for having me. Mm -hmm. All right. So thank you again for everybody for coming and joining us for this uh, presentation. And I, I hope you have a wonderful night. And uh, again, uh, thanks again for coming. And I hope... Uh, uh, Chief Cromie, that you will be have time to visit us uh, at some point in the future. We'd like wow. to show you around. When I get down to the island, I'll come on back. I, I, I'm, a, I'm an alum from uh, Galveston College. I, I, I went to Galveston College after, after high school for a couple of years working in the engineering division over there. So Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll welcome you back. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all for having me. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a wonderful night. Um, and I'll, we'll see you in the, for the next lecture then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.